Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. For rape victims, the trauma often doesn't end with their assault. In hopes of bringing an assailant to justice, victims typically undergo invasive and sometimes painful procedures to help law enforcement gather evidence. The DNA and other materials gathered goes into what's called a rape kit. But despite the work that went into compiling them for more than 10,000 Missouri rape victims, those kits never went anywhere. They never got tested and never even got cataloged. That's now changing. Thanks to a $3 million grant from the Federal Bureau of Justice Assistance, the Missouri Attorney General's office is finally addressing those rape kits. Those efforts were the focus of a story by St. Louis Public Radio reporter Jacqueline Driscoll that aired earlier this week. Joining me to talk about it is Jacqueline Driscoll. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Hello. First of all, 10,000 plus rape kits untested. How did we possibly get to this point? There are a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's resources. Um, One of the main issues that I do want to point out, sometimes the victims request that those kits go untested. So if they go to the hospital and they get a rape kit done, but they don't want to press any charges, they don't want police to be involved, then the hospital is required just to keep that there because of HIPAA. But there are other reasons as well, right? So one of the most concerning is that police might not believe the victims, so they didn't submit those kits. But yeah, thousands of rape kits sitting on shelves. Some are outside of the statute of limitations. So even if they do test them, there won't be any justice for those victims. You mentioned that in some cases it might be the victim who doesn't want that kit to be processed. Do we have any sense of, of what percentage of that total? We don't. We have no idea because there has not been any inventory done. We don't even know where the kits are throughout the state. We know that they're all over throughout the state, and there's larger amounts in the larger metropolis areas like St. Louis, but we don't know how many are where. Okay. And do we have any sense of how far back these kits go? Decades is all that I've been told. That Again, the part of this inventory system is just to figure that out. How old are they? Where are they located? How many of them are outside of the statute of limitations? Do the victims want them tested? Because a lot of times you know, decades back, they may not want to relive that. They may just want to push it aside and, 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 you know, not have it tested because a lot of these victims don't know if their kits have been tested or not unless they requested that it didn't. So why are we finally seeing some movement on this now? Well, it was all part of the grant that former Attorney General Josh Hawley received, but Attorney General Eric Schmidt has made it one of his priorities. It's one of his three initiatives. They call it the Safe Kit Initiative. And the primary purpose of it is Eric Schmidt just wants to get an inventory, a total tally. And a lot of states, this is not just a Missouri issue. This is something that has been an issue for states across the country, but a lot of other states have the inventory and they are now putting it into what's called an online database system. Missouri doesn't have that. Obviously, we don't even have an inventory system. So Attorney General Eric Schmidt does want to get them put into a database system. So not only do we know where these kits are, but it's also, I mean, it makes it easier for victims because they'll be able to have access to where their kits are if it's been tested, if it's not been tested, if it's going to be tested. Um, So just making it a little easier on the victims. So you talked to Attorney General Eric Schmidt about this issue. Here's what he said. That is inexcusable, that a potential crime had been committed, that a victim came forward, had the courage to submit to that test, and it is uh, literally sitting on a shelf somewhere. It's totally unacceptable. So they're in the process of creating this database of some sort. What happens next? It's a long process. Right now, they're still just trying to get a count of these kits. They are physically going to hospitals and police departments and tagging each kit so they can eventually scan them into an online system. They don't have any idea what that looks like yet. They don't know how much money it's going to cost. They know that they're going to need more money than the grant provides for right now. After that, that's probably going to be months out, he says. The database it could be a year or so. And then they would like to start putting in that information and comparing DNA so they can eventually prosecute victims. He says that's probably not going to be for years. Okay. You also spoke to a rape victim. Taylor Hearth was attacked by two men who broke into her apartment in Independence, and they raped her repeatedly while her two-year-old was in the room. All I knew was my daughter was awake, and she was sitting there watching me being raped with pants over my face. And I held her hand, and I told her it's going to be okay. 
Now, she went to the hospital and completed a rape kit, and she really pushed to make sure that it was processed. And even in that case, um, her case ended up being closed, but then the situation changed. Three months after that, I got a phone call in the middle of the night saying, I don't know if you heard about the kidnapping in the next state over where a sheriff's deputy was kidnapped, but we caught the guys. They're in custody. Their DNA matches the DNA in your rape kits. That's Taylor Hearth, a rape victim who spoke to Jacqueline Driscoll. Jacqueline, Taylor's story is really harrowing. What's your takeaway from what she told you? It, it was hard to listen to her story, obviously. Even just in the bits and pieces that you hear in my story, a lot is left out. She went through a very difficult time where she felt like she wasn't believed um, by some of the officers that responded to her case, and that's an issue for a lot of rape victims. It's a reason why they don't come forward is they fear that they aren't going to be believed. For Taylor, she used that as motivation. And I think when I spoke to her about her daughter was we kind of connected on a level of being mothers. I have two boys. She has one girl. She said as soon as she found out it was a girl, she was scared because she was bringing her into a world that it was very hard for women. And she wasn't even two years old and she'd already experienced something so horrifying. Witness this terrible thing. Right. So she just is so strong. Um, the fact that she continued to push, she was calling state senators, um, county legislators to make sure that her kit was going to be tested. I hate that she had to do that. That infuriates me as a woman that she had to push to get her kit tested. And also if she wanted any further information about where it was in the process, she had to call her detective. They they weren't um, communicating with her. So if anything, I hope that her story pushes law enforcement, pushes our, our legislators to make sure that someone never has to go through that again. Does she feel vindicated by the fact that, yeah, there ended up being a DNA match and these guys are now being put away? She does. And they're still going through some of the legal avenues for that. Um, I think she feels happy, um, uh, not happy, obviously, that the situation happened, but she does feel stronger. She got to face her rapists in court and kind of look them in the eye and be the one that came out stronger. But I know that she felt a little disappointed that they had to rape again for justice to be served. So um, again, she's just speaking out to make sure that the process gets better for people like her daughter in the future. And, and I find that really inspiring. St. Louis Public Radio reporter Jacqueline Driscoll, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.